For the month of June, we're going to be studying mixtape. It's the Psalms of David found in the Old Testament. And we think that you're going to love this study. And we'd love to have you with us at 8 o'clock, 9, 15, and 11 o'clock in this month of June. Mixtape, join us. Good morning. But before we hop into the scriptures this morning, I wanted to take just a minute and, and share from my heart about something. Um, we all heard the news that came out of Orlando last week with the shooting at the Pulse nightclub. And I just want to express uh, my, my grief and the heartache that I'm feeling for all of those people uh, in Orlando who are suffering. The shooting happened late last Saturday night, and so I didn't even hear about it until Sunday afternoon after church. And there's still a lot of details that are coming in. What we do know is that uh, a man uh, entered the nightclub Saturday night and, and went on a shooting spree. And the man did this as an act of tribute to the so-called Islamic State, uh, and a group that's done horrendous acts like this all around the world. I also believe that this guy targeted this nightclub in particular because it was popular among people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And in the end, at least 49 people were killed, and dozens of others are still in critical condition, and doctors are saying that they expect that the death toll is going to rise. And these people are real people. Uh, these are brothers and sisters, and sons and daughters, husbands and wives, who are leaving behind real families because of one man's actions. And I just want to say, as a, one of the pastors of this church, that we hate this. We grieve this, and we believe that God grieves this, that God grieves the condition of the world that he loves. And in moments like these, we believe that the response of the church should be like the response of Jesus to Mary and Martha when he learned about the death of their brother Lazarus. He went to them, he embraced them, and he wept with them. He gave them the ministry of his presence. And we believe that that's what we should do in situations like this, to be present and to pray. And I don't know if you saw it, but in the Tulsa world this last week, they posted pictures of a vigil that had happened in Tulsa after the shooting. And it was, it was attended by a lot of people who identify as LGBTQ. And the thing that broke my heart about seeing those pictures was the vigil happened in a nightclub. It didn't happen in a church. And the reality is that bars and nightclubs are often more of a sanctuary for people who identify as LGBTQ than the church. And so an attack on a nightclub like what happened in Orlando uh, makes people who identify in this way all the more insecure because it means this may be one less safe place for me to go. I just want to say that my prayer and hope would be that the church is the safest place in the world for everybody. That the church would be a community of broken people who are being put back together by the work of God's Spirit. People who freely admit that we need God's grace as much as anyone. We are not above needing forgiveness in the least bit. We come together because we need God's grace. We still believe that God believed, God designed sex to be shared between one man and one woman who are in a lifelong covenant with God and with each other. We haven't changed our views in the least bit. But we also believe that all people are of sacred worth. All people are created in God's image. And Christ died for all people, not just for church people, not just for some. So we remember the words of Scripture in moments like this. The call for us is to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. I know that there are people in our church who identify as LGBTQ. And it's courageous to come to church because, because we're pretty open about some of our views. But I want you to know that you belong in Christ's church. My prayer is that this community would always be for you a safe sanctuary. Let's 
let's take a moment and let's just pray. Pray for those who've, who've lost loved ones, for those who now are, live in fear. Um, and Jesus also tells us to pray for our enemies. So we pray for the family left behind, uh, the shooter, and pray for God's justice against radical groups like ISIS. Jesus said to pray. So church, let's pray. Father in heaven, you, you know what we need before we ask, but you invite us to ask. You say, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. And you don't just care for us, church people. God, you care for everybody. So we pray for those, those people who have lost a loved one to tragedy. To those who are grieving and not knowing how the world and their life is ever going to be the same, God, have mercy on them. For the wife of this shooter who still has to wake up in the morning and still has to go to the grocery store and still has to figure out how to live a normal life, Lord, have mercy. God, for the complexity of, of the issues of human sexuality, I mean, you know how poorly we engage these conversations. We need your wisdom and your discernment. We need you to guide your church that we might forever be like your son Jesus, people of grace and people of truth. These are waters we can't navigate on our own, so we depend on you. And God, we pray for justice against groups like ISIS, and Boko Haram, groups and individuals all over the world who use their power as people made in the image of God to suppress and to torture and to kill and to terrorize. And we pray for a swift justice that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God, now as we open your word, we just confess that we need you to be our teacher. And so together as your church and your people, we sit at your feet and we are ready to learn. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, if you've got a Bible, grab it. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you or if you don't have your phone handy, you can grab a Bible underneath your pew. We're going to be on page 843 in the pew Bible. This is Psalm uh, 1. And as you're turning there, I just want to say we're continuing in this sermon series called Mixtape. Mixtape is you know, about the Psalms. It's this eclectic collection of songs and poems and prose, this gorgeous writing that came out of of the Jewish people, and it's in our Old Testament as the book of Psalms. And these songs just run the the whole gamut of emotional experiences. So in last week, we read Psalm chapter 5, and we see desperation and anger and, and reasoning, pleading with God, the Psalm of David. And Two weeks ago, we heard from Pastor Tom read from Psalm 23, and it's the kind of psalm that we memorize as children. It's the kind of psalm you hear at funerals and gravesides because it's this expression of quiet confidence in the middle of adversity. And as Jan and Tiffany read uh, the scripture for us earlier, we noticed that Psalm 1 is different than the rest of the psalms. It takes on a different kind of tone. It sounds more like a proverb than a psalm. And for that reason, it belongs to this genre of literature called wisdom literature. It's a wisdom psalm. And it serves as a kind of introduction to the book of psalms as a whole. And we don't know who the author is, but the psalmist is offering this meditation on what it means to live the good life or to live a blessed life. And in the worldview of the psalmist, God's blessing is not about God raining down $65 million private jets on his people. It's not about promising people escalates with 24-inch rims. It's nothing like that. The idea of of, of blessing is less like doing a business transaction with God and more like the natural outpouring of what happens when we live life in alignment with God's law with God's instructions. In other words, a person is blessed who lives life as God intended it. So a couple of examples. A person is blessed who understands that the laws of gravity are here for our protection. And so a person who understands the laws of gravity and then avoids doing things like jumping off of cliffs is blessed in the sense that they do not get smushed to pieces. That person is blessed. A farmer is blessed who understands that God designed plant life to need both sunlight and water. 
And so the farmer who ensures that his plants, the crop under his care, gets the adequate proportions of those things is blessed and that that person gets to enjoy the fruit of their labor. And the person in an office setting or in your family who understands that not every email demands a reply all. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Amen. Is blessed in the sense that they are spared of having everyone they know roll their eyes at them. This is blessing. Being blessed is less about God doing you favors and more about God uh, giving you the natural outcome of what happens when you live life in alignment with his plans. So the psalmist is answering the question, anticipating the question, how do I live a blessed life? How do I live life that is in alignment with God's plans and intentions? We're going to spend the whole time this morning just looking at the text. So keep your Bible open, scribble down notes in your bulletin, and come back to it, underline words. Uh, Let's read this whole psalm together. Psalm 1, if you're in your pew Bible, it's 843. And let's read this in one voice. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." The psalmist begins this reflection with, blessed is the man, or blessed is the one. And he's about to make a claim about reality. He's about to say, a person is blessed who, then he goes on to describe this blessed person in two ways. First, negatively, and then positively. First, this person, a person is blessed who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. This repetition in Hebrew poetry is called parallelism. These three lines mean basically the same thing, but the repetition is there for em- emphasis. So it means basically the same thing. But in our English Bibles, we see the movement in much more of a pronounced way. So we go from st- walking to standing to sitting. And this deal, this definitely relates to the way that we have experienced temptation in the past. So you're just going along and something catches your eye. You're walking, you're standing. If you keep entertaining those thoughts and you linger, you stay there. That's how temptation works. Or a thought enters your mind. In that moment, you have the opportunity to say, no, I am not going to entertain that thought. Or you can say, well, I'm just going to give it a minute. And this is the way sin gets its claws in us. As we entertain these thoughts or we consider these mental pictures or whatever it is for long enough that we, we don't even realize it, but we have slowed down, we've decelerated, we're no longer in motion. And this is always the way that it works. Before we know it, we have done something or we've thought something or we've said something that we know is out of line with how God has built us to be. And so something that we would have previously called objectionable or reprehensible or morally wrong for us, we've done. And now we have the consequences that we have to deal with. We have a mess that we have to clean up. This is the way that sin works. No one goes from being fully committed to their marriage to committing adultery overnight. It happens bit by bit by bit. And the psalmist says a person who rejects this motion altogether... A person who, when they're faced with temptation, rejects it and keeps on trucking, that person is blessed because they have spared themselves a lot of harm. And then the psalmist goes on to describe the blessed person and the blessed life in positive terms. Rather than listening to the advice of those people who are living misaligned with God's word and how God built his world, a person is blessed who delights in God's law. Isn't that such a good word? Delights in God's law. To delight is to have this deep and abiding joy and sense of gratitude about something. 
Some of the best parenting advice I've ever gotten came from someone on our staff who said, your kids need to know that, that you delight in them. That whether they do well or they do, you know, they make poor choices, your kids should know that you are just thrilled that they exist. And in a similar way, the, the psalmist calls us to, to delight in the Word. In the same way that you parents love and adore that child even when they drive you crazy, we're supposed to delight in God's law even when it's challenging. God's law in this psalm is the means by which we can know what the blessed life is. So if you want to know how to live in alignment with God's want, what God wants, what God wants for you, you need to go to the Word. And how do you know the Word if you don't read the Word, if you don't listen to the Word? And how do you let the Word get into your heart if you don't spend time with it and meditate on it? And the psalmist calls it, the, the blessed person is the one who meditates on it day and night. And then in verse 3, he begins to describe the life, the benefits of the person who delights in God's law. It says, first, they're like a tree that's planted by streams of water. And notice that it doesn't say they're like a tree planted by a stream of water. They're like a tree planted by multiple streams of water. So we get the picture if one stream were to dry up, this person has multiple other streams from which they can derive nourishment. They've got more resources so when famine comes, they can handle it. They're prepared for it. And in contrast to the scarcity and the fear with which so many people live life, the person who delights in God's law has an abundance of resources from which they can draw. They're amply resourced for everything that life requires. The next, the, the person who delights in God's law is like a tree that yields fruit in season. And Charles Spurgeon, who's this great English preacher who has a famous commentary on the Psalms, said this about that verse. The man who delights in God's word, the one who delights in God's word, being taught by it, brings forth patience in the time of suffering, faith in the day of trial, and holy joy in the hour of prosperity. A person who's been nourished on God's word finds that God naturally produces within them the kind of strength and character and virtue they need to face the challenges of life. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Galatians chapter 5 as the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life, the evidence of that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And neither Paul nor the psalmist said these are the disciplines of the Spirit. They didn't say that a truly holy or righteous person can conjure up these behaviors. They said, no, this is the natural outflowing of a person who has been nourished on God's Word and in whom God's Spirit dwells. And we should pay attention that the promise here, the, the, the message of the psalm is not that this blessing is primarily something that's external. God is not pri primarily promising that we're never going to have challenges in life. He's not saying that. He's not promising that we're always going to have impeccable health or we're going to be wealthy and have money out the wazoo. That is not what God and the psalms here are promising. It's none of these things. And Pastor Tom has said so many times over the years that we need to develop a theology of suffering because we're going to suffer in this life one way or another. And the Psalms are not telling us otherwise. But the Psalms do promise, the Psalms do explain that in God's reality, for those who are living in alignment with how God says to live, they will experience blessing in two key ways. There are two dynamics of blessing. The first we've already talked about is nourishment. That when the trial comes, there are the wells of resources to draw from. When your patience is challenged, that patience is there and you can tap into that. The strength, the character, the virtue, everything that you need to face challenges is there. The other thing that's there is God equips us. He nourishes us, us to handle the successes of life and the joys of life. You know, I, a couple older mentors of mine have this in common, that they have such an easy laugh. And these are certainly men and women who have been weathered, who have been tested by challenges in life but they don't take themselves too seriously. And they have an easy laugh in a good sense of humor. The person who is being nourished on God's word is equipped to face challenges, but they're also equipped to handle joys and to experience joy more than most. 
The other dynamic of God's blessing is continuity. And we have this picture of a tree that's well nourished. It's thoroughly planted. It's got deep roots. It's producing fruit. It's a picture of continuity. So saying the person who delights in God's law, who meditates on it day and night, will, inha- will receive these blessings of continuity. Their life is going to matter. Their legacy at some level is going to count that from God's perspective, in the view of all history, the person who has delighted in God's word and been nourished on it, the people in whom God's spirit has dwelled, these people will have continuity and a lasting legacy and impact. But then the psalm transitions. And then in the King James Version it says, but not so the wicked, not so. All of those wonderful things that can be said about the person who is nourished on God's word, who delights in God's law, none of those things can be said of the wicked. In fact, it uses this language of impermanence. It calls him chaff. In the view of God's history, the wicked are going to be proved to be impermanent, chaff. Their legacy is not going to continue. The way that they have lived is going to come to an end. I was walking into the building this week, and I don't know if you noticed, there's always litter blowing across our property, across the church property. And, you know, it's because we're close to so much retail and fast food. There's always trash out there. So if you see it, pick it up, okay? But I was thinking, as I was walking in, and I saw a styrofoam cup on the ground, and I picked it up. Um, That's what the psalm says the wicked are like. No roots, no permanence, no legacy, no continuity. In the view of history, this person and this way of living is going to be a thing of the past. It's gone. And the outcome of the wicked here in the psalm, we should note, is not punishment. It's not God scolding them. It's not that they're impermanent because they did wrong. They're impermanent because this is the way that they've chosen to live. I've got a flower pot in my backyard. And uh, I haven't given it proper sunlight, and I haven't watered it. And guess what? It's dead. God didn't do that. I did that. And that's really important to notice about this psalm, that the blessing is not primarily God doing a favor, and the and the, the doom is not primarily God's punishment. The psalmist is saying, this is how life works. This is how reality will prove to have work in the grand view of history, that when we live in alignment with God's ways, there's blessing, there's nourishment, there's continuity, and we live misaligned with God's ways, there's impermanence, and there's, there's challenge, and there's pain. This is not God's doing, this is our doing. And then the psalm concludes, God watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Again, this is not that God is doing favors for some people and he's not doing favors for others. It's saying that God has set up the world in particular ways, that there are ways of living that are inherently blessed, that God has said, if you go this way, it will go well for you, and there are ways that we could live that are self-destructive. God's saying, choose this way, not this one. You are blessed if you pay attention to gravity, You are blessed if you feed and water your plants. And you are blessed if you are nourished upon God's word. If you've developed such an appetite for God's law that it's a delight to you. It's something that you've got to get at all times of the day that you meditate upon day and night. And then you allow God to reorder your life around the things that you've learned. Church, we cause ourselves such harm by not paying attention to the message of the psalm. Oh my goodness. And the blessing that we deny ourselves when we choose to go our own way, when we insist on charting our own course, when we refuse to follow the ancient path that's been carved out for us, the harm we cause ourselves and the blessing we deny ourselves when we choose to live like this. But the truth is that no matter how badly we want to follow God's law and how badly we want to deny those impulses, those things that we know are destructive for us, apart from God's work in us, we can't do a thing about it. The New Testament talks about us in language like we are dead in our sin. Dead people can't do much to solve problems. 
And apart from God, that's where we are. But the good news is this, that the punishment and the blame and the curse that should be on us for living in ways that are misaligned with God's law, the punishment for that was laid on the shoulders of Christ on the cross. The punishment that was supposed to be mine became his, and the blessing that was his become ours through faith in his name. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ, in his death and his resurrection, it's through the regenerating work of his spirit that the Father pours out on anyone who asks that we can have the opportunity to live a new life, that we can be empowered, that our will can be liberated so that we choose God's ways and reject the ways that are going to be self-destructive and cause us harm. And it's for this reason, with the confidence of what happens with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the merits of Christ's death and resurrection, that the Apostle Paul can say in Romans chapter 12, I urge you, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is the worship God wants. Don't conform anymore to the pattern of this world, because we know where that leads. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect and pleasing will is. You want to know how to live a blessed life and a good life? Let your mind be transformed by the renewing work of God's Spirit. And how does God's Spirit work? One of the primary ways is when we come to delight in and meditate on and be nourished by God's Word. For those of us who have been following in the way of Jesus for a long time, this is a call for us to eat every day. It's a call for us to be nourished. Sometimes reading God's Word is a, is a developed taste. It's an acquired taste. And we read it and we think, well, I don't get anything out of it. We have no endurance. We have to learn how to like coffee sometimes, but I promise you it's worth it, at least from my perspective. We need to develop an appetite for God's word. If you are a disciple of Jesus, last week we said we harm ourselves with prayerless lives. Boy, this week we deprive ourselves with scriptureless lives. And for those of you who have not yet entered into the way of Jesus, you've not yet counted yourself a disciple of Jesus, there is hope for you. You don't have to be tethered or shackled by anything. And as we sang earlier, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Man, Don't we all feel it? Aren't we all so disappointed with the choices we make? Paul said in Romans, you know, the good things I want to do, I don't do those. And the bad things I really don't want to do, I end up doing them anyway. We all get it. There's hope in the regenerating work of God's Spirit. You can experience that through faith in Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to Him as your Lord. Count yourselves among His disciples and learn what it means to follow in the way of Jesus in the company of of his disciples and the company of the church. God's word promises us that whenever we preach his word or share his word, that it doesn't come back void, that it does something. So this morning, as God's spirit is working among his church, as he promised to be with us, I challenge you and I invite you, I urge you to make a response. Maybe you want to come down and you want to pray. Maybe you want to kneel or close your eyes at your seat. Or maybe as the team leads us in a song, you just make that your prayer but this is all I can do for you as a pastor is to call you to talk to Jesus, to draw you to him, to point your attention to him. And now choose today to respond. Let's pray. Father in heaven, through your son Jesus and by the invitation of your spirit, we come. Not because we are worthy on our own or righteous on our own, not because we have, del- we have consistently chosen the path of blessing, but really we come asking for help because we haven't. Pour out your spirit on our church that we might hunger and thirst for the truth, that we might be like trees planted by streams of water so that whatever we face in life, we are nourished and we know that you will make our lives count. And God, for those who have not yet entrusted their lives to you, would you give them the courage to say, yes, believe in Jesus. I trust that the punishment I deserved was laid on him and I'm gonna give my life to him. He might count me alive. God, we give ourselves to you. Thank you for the message of scripture that 
while we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, you can come. Respond. Thanks again for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the message, and we'd love to have you join us at our campus, 8 o'clock, 9.15, and 11 o'clock.